Forget the AI race, let's invest in a data grid for AI. This is the title of one of the articles that was released by Palantir's CTO, Akash Jain. This article came out November 17, 2020. I have never seen this article before. I'm actually reading it live while you guys are going to be uh, hearing my thoughts and my analysis on this article. And this is the first time I think many of you have come across this article. Why? Because, I mean, a lot of people don't find this stuff that easily. I was recently going through a lot of the technical people that work at Palantir. I did a video the other day on Palantir CTO, Akash Shane, who is also the president of their U.S. governmental sector. And he really talks about how to operationalize AI and data for the government. And he recently did an interview. I'll link that in the description that only 84 people had seen on YouTube. So I was like, let's get some more people seeing this interview to see the technical people of Palantir actually speak about Palantir. And I came across this article that he put out about two years ago or about a year and a half ago. And I thought it was really interesting to just take a, a deep dive into it. I read a little bit of it, but not really super in depth. We're actually going to do this right now on this video uh, today. Now, the title of this article is very interesting. Forget the AI race. Let's invest in a data grid for AI. Already, you can see that he's saying, look, Everyone has it wrong, and it makes sense because Palantir, you know, claims to be five years ahead of people. Everyone has it wrong in terms of developing AI or the race for AI. The race for AI is not what they're necessarily going for. The data grid for AI, which to me kind of sounds like not the gold, kind of the shovels. How do we make a framework for artificial intelligence to be able to operationalize it within businesses at, at, and, and governments at scale versus just trying to race for the best AI, given how vague and esoteric that type of idea is. So... Let's get into this real quick. Before I get into it, I wanted to go to this quick Reddit post, or sorry, Quora post. What do Palantir employees think about Aki Jane, who's the CTO? Now, this guy worked there for two and a half years. His was This was his answer. I worked there for just under two years, and I was consistently impressed with him. I found him to have a great blend of data-driven executiveness and real human concern, compassion, and reasonableness. And if you see that interview that I link in the description, he's a very good communicator. Like, he's a guy who's technical, who actually knows how to talk, um, and actually, like, uh, relate to people at scale. To be fair, I also felt very positive about the other execs there. I was lucky to be there when I was, and I found that whole C team, uh, C level team synergized very well. So that's a good response by someone who understands Aki Jane. All right, I'll be reading this in real time and giving my thoughts and my analysis for it. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Uh, about two pages, so it might take us like seven, eight minutes to read through it, but I'm going to be giving my analysis at the same time as well. Neil Armstrong's small step for man in 1969 was a symbolic resolution to the Cold War's most visible global security power struggle, the space race. As a victor, the U.S. proved its technological superiority, leading the Soviets to largely concede the space domain to the U.S., and what inspired us to get into space was the fact that Russia had so much dominance there. More broadly, the U.S. ability to come from behind demonstrated the underlying strength of its economic, technological, and scientific systems. It makes sense that he's starting off this article talking about the United States because he's the president of the USG division of Palantir. Today, we're in another pursuit for technological superiority, what has been dubbed the artificial intelligence race, or the AI race. However, unlike the lunar landing, the so-called AI race has no clearly defined finish line. We know we have an immediate competitor, China, but how will we know if and when we have won? The ambiguity around this question is why I believe we need to forget the notion of a singular AI race and instead focus our efforts on building a data infrastructure to tackle any AI challenge. And that, to me, is just like really cool if you're a technologist, if you're an optimist, if you're someone who's investing in companies that you think they can really grow. The entire mantra and ethos and paradigm that this guy is talking about is a little bit different than just a race for AI, but rather an infrastructure on how to understand AI. And we'll get more into that as we read the article. For the U.S. to position itself as a place of technological strength for decades to come, we must create systems that allow for steady, continuous, and trustworthy progress on AI. Andrew Ning's analogy of AI as, as electricity helps us see that we're in the infancy of, in, infancy of AI's potential. While AI is substantially more complex than electricity, it is similar in that it is a powerful enabling technology, not an end in and of itself. What we are missing is a way to make an enduring, scalable, and reliable use of that technology. So what he means there when he says AI is not an end in and of itself, he's making the argument that AI is not this terminal, and terminal means like final end result product that we get and that we use. AI is a means to an end. It is a technology that gets us somewhere. So I was interviewing a, uh, we'll get back to the article in, in a second. I was interviewing a former IBM employee named Sean, Invest to Live is his YouTube channel. I'll link that in the description as well. And I asked him, what are the real use cases of AI? Because it can't just be like a better song to get recommended on Spotify or a better video to get recommended on YouTube. I think that's a very powerful use of AI. It's probably the reason you've even found this video. It's important, but it's not like the most important, right? And Sean was talking about how carbon net zero, that's an AI data-driven problem. Drug discovery, making sure you one day can put something on your arm and it can tell you how likely you are to have a stroke, that's an AI data-driven problem. There are so many ways to innovate the way we can transform human potential for life, happiness, pursuit of happiness, the ability to survive longer with AI and with this type of technology, and we are in the true infancy of the potential of AI to the point where right now, 
advertising is optimized on YouTube, right? You like, you know, something's more likely or someone's more likely to click on an ad and you can quantify that down to the exact percentage, but that's not the biggest use case of AI. And I think that's what Jane is talking there uh, when he's talking about how we're in the infancy of this technology. When introduced in the 19th century, in incandescent bulbs were revolutionary. At first, only those consumers who had their own electricity generator could make any use of them, limiting limiting their seemingly endless potential. Thomas Edison realized that he could sell many more light bulbs if there was an easy way for anyone to receive electricity. Without the electric grid, we would never have seen the widespread adoption of the incandescent bulb and the subsequent surge of innovation to create many other electric devices. So he's saying the bulb was kind of the first springboard for us to be able to get all these other things. We've been caught up designing individual AI ML models like light bulbs, but we don't have a unified infrastructure to serve as our modern day electrical grid equivalent. That is interesting. A modern day electrical grid is fundamentally different than just a cog in the machine, which is like the light bulb in the grid. A grid is an infrastructure, a framework that allows electricity to flourish at scale and obviously allow more innovation. So it's interesting to see how he's going to make that uh, comparison for AI. One particular compelling reason to invest in such an infrastructure is that AI models aren't something that can be sprinkled around to make any project better. Most AI models deployed today are quite brittle. They have, de they have been developed and trained for a specific use case under specific conditions. Once deployed, model performance and quality may degrade quickly as the data environment evolves. Further, throwing a model at an adjacent problem without retraining it usually does not work. That makes a lot of sense as well. AI-driven models are based upon the data that they get to constantly relearn and constantly get trained. So if you just throw it at something without it being able to train, uh, it's not going to have that much of an effect. To give an illustrative example, an AI model for identifying pathologies in x-ray films was unable to be repurposed at another hospital due to a difference in the radiology films used by different machines. And that was in a nearly identical use case. Interesting. So he's saying we had an AI model that we trained to, de uh, to, to find pathologies in x-ray films, and it wasn't able to be used in another use case, even though the data and the, and the technology and the purpose of it is pretty much identical. Uh, and I'm assuming it's because we don't have an AI infrastructure. To harness the value that is currently available from AI, ensuring models are continuously provided with appropriate training data and feedback to improve its, its critical. We must create a holistic AI and data environment, a grid that works around AI model brittleness by making it easy to retrain and evaluate models and share training data within appropriate security data production uses boundaries. That's interesting. So he's basically making the argument that we need to have a like a foundational element that everything is built on top of that kind of like reminds me of foundry to some extent. Um, and I'm trying to see the similarities there that people can use and institutions can use AI to train their models without having to not be able to repurpose their model simply because they're using it in a different use case that's not exactly identical, but that's like 95% identical. The U.S. government will struggle to retain the lead in AI because this infrastructure does not exist, and that's italicized, which means for those who are just listening and not watching, um, he's he, he, like he's trying to stress a point right here. Academics, governmental researchers, and private companies are often silos, buildings, incredible building incredible AI capabilities. But like a solitary light bulb, they are illuminating but a single room in a single house at a time. I love the metaphors. For the U.S. to maintain technological superiority, we must build the data infrastructure that will allow entire skyscrapers to be illuminated. Again, this is kind of poetic, to be honest. We must also enable new innovations, not just light bulbs, but toasters, televisions, and beyond. We must have a means for scaling existing capabilities in the real world and encouraging the development of new ones. And we must do so in a way that stays sure to our democratic values. Let's invest in a data grid for AI. That's cool. And I'm assuming that's what Palantir, you know, this is interesting because if we'll get back into the article in a second, if Palantir is trying to create the data grid for AI, which, you know, in a nutshell, that to me means that they are trying to create network effects built on a platform it, and it could be Foundry or Gotham, right? And these might be the innovations that they're coming out with later in the year and in, in terms of product rollout that allow companies to be able to use their platform to build training models on top of them that don't always have to be repurposed in a different way or that can be repurposed in a different way without losing all of the the, the AI models that it, that it built up for so much time getting the data to be able to train, which is the difference between the light bulb and the actual foundation then that's a really big innovation. I mean, that's a really big deal. And I'm assuming I mean, other companies are likely working on this, but it seems like Palantir and the reason the CTO published this is because there is a different um, uh, use case, especially for the US government to, 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 to remain technologically superior to other countries to be able to develop this foundation, right? If this foundation is developed, the US government can have a fundamentally superior role because they're not just chasing singularity, uh, singular AI products. They're, they have an entire infrastructure to be able to 
build on top of. So he goes further into the government point right here. Just as governments play a role in enforcing standards related to electrical current flow, the U.S. government has to play a role in establishing our own grid. Investing in a data grid for AI is a strategic move that will not only result in an immediate spike in innovation in the short term, but will allow for sustained step-by-step -step advancement in the long term. There are several key components, but we'll need to get them right. Designed for iteration, not stagnation, AI systems are learning systems that require constant iteration and feedback. We must build our infrastructure so that it can evolve. Electrical grids today are flexible to support a variety of energy sources, from solar power to coal-fired generators, so too must our AI infrastructure empower AI firms and governmental programs to adapt to various systems. And just as grids can surge resources in response to demands, we should build in connectivity, which in turn allows us to discover and build towards emerging demand and refine further develop uh, new capabilities. Create AI deployment infrastructure, government consumers should have an easy access this point to discover, evaluate, and deploy potential AI ML solutions and training data, monitor algorithmic performance, and capture and save any feedback. Adopt open data standards. That makes a lot of sense to, to normalize this stuff. Just as we have standards for voltage, we need standards for the format, quality, and curation of data systems and APIs. Fund an AI training data library. This is their sort of appeal to the government to fund these things. AI ML models depend on our quality of data to train and test. Large, diverse data sets to help mitigate algorithmic biases, and our government is best positioned to conduct quality assurance on this data and enable appropriate access to it. By building out this training data library thoughtfully instead of via ad hoc disconnected efforts, our government can both spur AI development and ensure that training data sets are curated ethically and transparently. And finally, keep our grid secure. We must protect our electricity grid from hackers. Similarly, we must ensure that our AI training grid algorithms and deployment infrastructure are secure. So five elements there for what he thinks an AI grid looks like. Uh, designing for iteration and not stagnation, which means it's constantly being innovated upon. Create a deployment infrastructure. This to me sounds exactly like Apollo, right? Which is like the ability for companies to actually use Palantir software to ship out new products over the air in, in this like really interesting way without having to constantly do a lot of work. Adopting open data standards that builds more of the community. Fund an AI training data library. That means the government is actually putting money into like the electric grid, like the AI grid to make sure there is constant funding for models to be able to uh, rule out biases and to learn from other pre-existing models and constantly those network effects to be able to evolve. And then keeping our grid secure, obviously from a cybersecurity perspective, it's very important. Last paragraph. Following the above guidelines in conjunction with existing calls to adhere to strong AI ethic principles and standards, we can invest in an AI infrastructure that enables not just the occasional incandescent bulb, but empowers an entire generation with access to enabling technologies that will buoy innovation and potential use cases are discovered. By investing in a grid, we can unlock the enormous potential of AI development and ensure our technological, economic, democratic, and military superiority for decades to come. And Aki Jane serves as president of Palantir USG, and he is the official CTO. Really, really interesting article. I will, leave, I will leave it in the description. I mean, when I just saw the title of it, I was like, this is something that I want to read a little bit more of because I don't think most Palantir people and Palantir investors have actually seen this article. Um, this, If anything, to me, it shows two things. Number one, it shows how Palantir is thinking about AI and they're thinking about it in a way that's a bit different and a bit differentiated from a lot of the other ways the companies are thinking of AI because if your head CTO is like, we need to create an operating system, a foundation, an ontological relationship by which AI interacts with companies, businesses, governments, et cetera, uh, that's a you know plus to me just in terms of the ethos and philosophy that the company has and that they're building into their products if they're thinking in this certain way. And number two is like they've worked with the government right for 17 years so they understand very intimately and deeply the problems that the government has and this is sort of you know palantir's uh, lobbying effort to some extent in, in an article that says hey if we actually build an ai infrastructure in the united states we're going to be superior technologically because it's not just building a bulb it's not just an innovation of electricity it's an electric grid and what an electric grid does is allow the uh, innovations like a toaster or a television because all of these things connect to electricity and because they connect to electricity and power now you have innovations you can build on top of that like the World Wide Web, where you can access video content like I'm doing right now. It is such an interesting time to be alive, to be able to create content and get people to actually be able to consume it from all around the world. That is only possible because we have electricity, and that's also only possible because we have the internet. The internet was built off electricity, but there was an electric grid, a foundation for the internet to be created. The internet had a foundation for YouTube and other apps to be created on top of that. And now we're in this new technological revolution. Imagine if that entire framework I just described was happening for AI and machine learning at scale. What innovations could we create and what technologies could be at the center of this grid that would actually make the world much more stronger and uh, much more efficient, effective, productive, meaningful, happier than it is right now based on the innovation it could create. Really interesting stuff. Let me know your thoughts on this. Uh, leave it in the comments. Looking forward to reading them. Thank you guys for watching this video, and I'll leave this article in the description if you guys want to check it out. Thank you for watching. Looking forward to your comments. I'll see you guys in the next one.